Welcome to the lecture on David Hume's An Enquiry Concerning Human Understanding, Section 4, Part 2. I'm Andrew Chapman, and in this lecture we're going to be learning about something that epistemologists and philosophers of science call the problem of induction. The problem of induction is fundamentally a problem about justifying a particular way of reasoning that's used especially in science, but also in many of our everyday activities when we move about the world successfully. It seems so obvious at first when we look at inductive reasoning that inductive reasoning is sound, that we can get true conclusions from true premises. However, when we dig just a little bit deeper, we can see that it's very difficult for us to figure out exactly why inductive reasoning is justified. Says Hume, when it is asked, what is the nature of all our reasonings concerning matter of fact? The proper answer seems to be that they are founded on the relation of cause and effect. When again it is asked, what is the foundation of all our reasonings and conclusions concerning that relation? it may be replied in one word, experience. But if we still carry on our sifting humor and ask, what is the foundation of all conclusions from experience? This implies a new question, which may be of more difficult solution and explication. Now with these words, Hume is showing us that when we get down to the foundation of our conclusions that we derive from experience of the world, we can see that oftentimes these conclusions rely on certain ways of reasoning that themselves need to be justified, but which it may be very difficult to justify. Some background on David Hume. Hume was a Scottish Enlightenment philosopher, historian, essayist, sometimes economist, who lived through much of the 1700s from 1711 to 1776, and he was one of the later of what is called the uh, early modern philosophers. Some of the other famous early modern philosophers that you may have heard of are Rene Descartes and John Locke. Hume was famous for uh, a number of his views, but most strikingly among them were his epistemological views, uh, known as empiricism and skepticism, and uh, his both epistemological and metaphysical view of naturalism. And his empiricism, especially, as well as his naturalism, have affected a number of philosophers uh, through the 20th century, um, as well as on to today. What we're going to be looking at today from Hume is his epistemological views as they concern uh, this very particular sort of reasoning known as induction. And it's important to keep in mind that Hume's views on induction follow directly from his empiricism, and we'll look at what empiricism is momentarily. But first, just a little bit on epistemology. Epistemology is one of the main branches of philosophical study and of academic philosophy, and has been since Plato inaugurated the formal study of epistemology with his dialogue, the Theaetetus. Epistemologists are concerned with knowledge, justification, and belief primarily, and some of the central questions asked by epistemologists are, what is the nature of knowledge, that is, what's the essence of knowledge, and what can be known? Notice the distinction between these two questions. The first is asking what something's central nature is, where the second is asking about particular instances of things that uh, are bound together by that nature. What's the nature of justification, and what can we be justified in believing? Notice that we've got the same uh, sort of pair here as we had with the first two. What is the nature of belief? What does it mean to believe something? And finally, under what conditions is belief appropriate? 
Epistemology is primarily concerned with the knower, that is, the subject or the person, and secondarily concerned with the things known, that is, with the world or objects of knowledge. So anytime somebody's uh, doing an epistemological investigation or talking about epistemology, they're primarily talking about subjects or persons or agents who are knowers or believers or the sorts of things that can be justified in believing or doing things and only secondarily concerned with the particular sorts of things that are known. A central distinction in epistemology is the distinction between empiricism and rationalism. Now, empiricism and rationalism are the names of epistemological positions concerning the source of justification or knowledge. Now, you may have heard these terms empiricism or rationalism before, but note that in epistemology they have very specific meanings, and oftentimes epistemologists would be glad if people who outside of the philosophical uh, conversation were using these terms used them in the ways that epistemologists generally do not least of which for the reason, uh, because of the reason that um, when people use these terms outside of epistemology, oftentimes they're very sloppy about the way these terms are used and they get into needless arguments with one another because they're using terms in a, in a non-precise way. So here's the precise way to use these terms. Empiricism is the epistemological position that all justification and all knowledge derive from sensory experience. Another way to put that is there is no knowledge or justification that can arise or derive from anything other than sensory experience. And another way to put that is if you've got yourself justification or knowledge, then it must be derived from sensory experience. Rationalism, on the other hand, is the epistemological position that not all justification and knowledge derive from sensory experience. That is, there's at least some justification or knowledge that derives from non-sensory sources. Now notice that rationalism is not the position that all knowledge derives from non-sensory sources. It's just the position that at least some knowledge or justification derives from non-sensory sources. So empiricism and rationalism are jointly exhaustive positions. Somebody is either an empiricist or a rationalist when it comes to knowledge and justification. The empiricism-rationalism distinction is tied closely to the a posteriori, a priori distinction in terms of justification. Now, these terms are a little bit odd looking, um, so make sure when you're using the terms yourself, you get that a ah, in there, that a ah, is part of the term, a ah, posteriori and a ah, priori. A ah, posteriori and a ah, priori are adjectives that are used to describe the relation between something, usually justification, and sensory experience. So they tell you the relation between justification, sometimes knowledge, and sensory experience. A posteriori justification is justification that's derived entirely from the senses. So if somebody says they have a posteriori justification for something, what they mean is that that justification comes entirely from sensory sources. A priori justification, on the other hand, is justification that is not entirely derived from sensory sources. Now notice here again that a posteriori and a priori are jointly exhaustive positions in that there is no middle position between the a posteriori and the a priori. And the a priori is not justification that is derived entirely from non-sensory sources. It's just justification that is not entirely derived from sensory sources. So, uh, I imagine that you see how these are related to the empiricism-rationalism distinction. Empiricists are people who claim that there is no such thing as a priori justification, that all justification is a posteriori, comes through the senses, while rationalists, on the other hand, claim that there is at least some a priori justification. 
So rationalists, again, are not people who say that experience doesn't matter, that no justification comes through the senses, that no justification is a posteriori. They're just people who say that at least some justification, at least sometimes, comes from non-sensory sources. Now the problem of induction that we'll be talking about in this lecture is a problem that deals with a very specific sort of logical reasoning. So it's a good idea for us to get a quick handle on what logic and logical reasoning are. Logic is concerned with the rules for right reasoning. Now notice that this definition in terms that uh, includes that term rules. Logic isn't concerned with how people actually do reason. That might be something that psychologists could take a look at or maybe sociologists would be interested in. Philosophers who study logic and logicians are concerned with how we ought to be reasoning, the rules for reasoning correctly. Now, reasoning occurs via arguments. Argument here does not mean just yelling at somebody. An argument is a formalized set of sentences that are intended to prove something is true. And arguments have two parts, a conclusion, the thing that's uh, being proven, or at least attempted to be proven as true, and at least one premise. And the premise or set of premises are the reasons or evidence given in favor of the truth of the conclusion. Right reasoning, the sort of thing that logic is concerned with, is reasoning that produces a true conclusion given true premises. And the reason why we would be concerned with right reasoning, and hence with logic, is because we want a way to extend our knowledge from the things that we are already justified in believing, or the things that we already know, to new conclusions. And logic gives us a set of tools for doing that. If we put true things into a good logical argument, then the hope is that we get true things out and thereby extend our knowledge or justification. There are many different types of logical reasoning, but a main distinction that philosophers and logicians make in terms of logical reasoning is the distinction between deductive logical reasoning and inductive logical reasoning. And I'll tell you briefly about each one of those. First, deductive reasoning. A well-structured deductive argument, that is, an argument that uses deductive reasoning, guarantees a true conclusion giving true premises. Another way to say that is, if you've got a good deductive argument and you put true things into it in terms of the premises, then there's no possible way for you to get a false conclusion out of it. Here are a couple of examples for you. Premise 1, all cats are mammals. Premise 2, Felix is a cat. Therefore, conclusion, Felix is a mammal. Now notice that if 1 and 2 are true, there's no possible way for 3 to be false. If Felix is a cat and all cats are mammals, then Felix must be a mammal. And notice that we could recreate this argument using things other than cats and felix and mammals, and we could get uh, a very similar sort of thing. So essentially what logic is concerned with is the structure of arguments. Now that's beyond what we'll be talking about here, but you'll notice that when we're talking about both deductive and inductive reasoning, the structure of the arguments plays a big part in making an argument good or bad. Here's a second example of deductive reasoning that has a slightly different structure. Premise 1. Either the sun is shining or the sun's behind the clouds. Premise 2. The sun isn't behind the clouds, therefore, and of course you can predict the conclusion, the sun is shining. Now, if 1 and 2 are true, 3, that conclusion, has to be true. There's no possible way for that conclusion to be true. Now this isn't saying that the premises actually are true, it's just saying that if they were true, 
your conclusion would be guaranteed to be true. The central property of deductive reasoning is that conclusions are guaranteed true if the premises are true. Now let's contrast deductive reasoning with inductive reasoning. A well-structured inductive argument, that is an argument that uses inductive reasoning, makes a conclusion probable given true premises. So notice right away the distinction that's going on here. With deductive reasoning, conclusions were guaranteed given true premises. With inductive reasoning, conclu conclusions are just probable given true premises. Here are a couple of examples of inductive reasoning. Most mammals don't lay eggs. Gary, he's a mammal. Therefore, Gary doesn't lay eggs. Now, if one and two are true, that conclusion that Gary doesn't lay eggs is probable. Now, it's not guaranteed. It might be the case that most mammals don't lay eggs, that Gary is a mammal, but that Gary still lays eggs. Gary might be, for example, a platypus. But it is probable that if most mammals don't lay eggs and Gary is a mammal, that Gary doesn't lay eggs. Here's another example for you. The sun rose today, the sun rose yesterday, etc. Meaning, you know, the sun rose two days ago, the sun rose three days ago, the sun rose four days ago. Therefore, the sun will rise tomorrow. Now, it might be the case that something horrible happens to the sun overnight. Sun doesn't rise tomorrow. There would, of course, be many other awful implications for those of us on Earth if something terrible happened to the sun. But just because the sun rose yesterday and today and two days ago, that doesn't guarantee us that the sun is going to rise tomorrow. So our conclusion here, while probable, isn't guaranteed. And that is the distinction, the central distinction between induction and deduction. Induction makes the conclusions probable, and deduction makes the conclusions certain. Now you might say, why would we ever use inductive reasoning and only get probably true conclusions if we could use deductive reason, uh, reasoning and get conclusions that are guaranteed to be true? Well, oftentimes we can use deductive reasoning, and we should when we can, but there are many different subjects, topics, things that we might reason about that don't lend themselves to deductive reasoning, and instead uh, we can only reason about them using inductive reasoning. And you'll see a number of those in the remainder of this lecture. One of the central things to notice is that Induction and experience through the senses are tightly tied together. Now, we oftentimes can't directly experience the underlying principles that make the world work. So, for example, we can't directly experience the laws of nature. No one has ever seen the laws of nature. They have indirectly seen the effects of the laws of nature, so we can learn about the laws of nature indirectly, and the way that we do that is via inductive reasoning. So here's a quotation from Hume. But notwithstanding this ignorance of natural powers and principles, we always presume when we see like sensible qualities that they have like secret powers. By secret powers here, Hume just means powers that we can't directly experience. And we expect that effects similar to those which we have experienced will follow from them. If a body of like color and consistence with that of bread, which we have formerly eaten, be presented to us, we make no scruple of repeating the experiment and foresee with certainty, like nourishment and support. Now this is a process of the mind or thought of which I would wittingly, willingly know the foundation. So notice what Hume is saying here. Hume is saying, we use inductive reasoning to go, through, to go from things that we've experienced in the past 
to conclusions about the present or the future. And Hume is saying, how do we do this? So before we get into the specific problem of justifying induction, we should uh, further talk about who is it that needs to use induction. Hume says, in reality, all arguments from experience are founded on the similarity which we discover among natural objects and by which we are introduced, excuse me, induced to expect effects similar to those which we have found to follow from such objects. And though none but a fool or madman will ever pretend to dispute the authority of experience or to reject that great guide of human life, it may surely be allowed a philosopher to have so much curiosity at least as to examine the principle of human nature which gives this mighty authority to experience and makes us draw advantage from that similarity which nature has placed among different objects. From causes which appear similar, we expect similar effects. This is the sum of all our experimental conclusions. So, in response to the question, who needs induction, Hume says, anybody who ever argues from experience, ever. And the arguments from experience don't need to be made explicit. Any time you rely on experience to come to a conclusion or to perform some action, you're using induction. And surely, most people don't question how we're able to do this, but a philosopher might want to know how we're able to do this. How are we justified in going from experience to things yet unexperienced? How can we do this? Even further, we might generalize Hume's claims here and look at different sorts of inductive moves. Any argument that moves from claims about experience in the past or the present to claims about the future uses induction. So if you've ever said this happened in the past or it's currently happening, therefore there's reason to expect it will continue in the future, that's using induction. Any argument that moves from claims about some set of particulars, no matter how large the set of particulars, to the set of all such objects, uses induction. So if you've seen a number of objects or persons of a certain type and you conclude something about all such objects or persons, you've used induction. And finally, any argument that moves from some particular having certain properties in the past to some particular having certain properties in the present uses induction. So this is similar to our first one, although importantly different. Any time you've seen something and you use your memory of seeing that thing to form conclusions about how it will presently behave, you're using induction. So what's the problem with induction? Hume says only a madman would say that we can't use experience, past experience, present experience, in order to draw conclusions about the future, or experience of particulars in order to draw experience about members of the general set. What's the problem? Well, says Hume, as to past experience, it can be allowed to give direct and certain information of those precise objects only, and that precise period of time which fell under its cognizance. But why this experience should be extended to future times and to other objects, which for aught we know may be only in appearance similar, this is the main question on which I would insist. These two propositions are far from being the same. I have found that such an object has always been attended with such an effect, and I foresee that other objects which are, in appearance, similar will be attended with similar effects. I shall allow, if you please, that the one proposition may justly be inferred from the other. I know, in fact, that it always is inferred. 
But if you insist that the inference is made by a chain of reasoning, then I desire you to produce that reasoning. It's not enough that we in fact rely on induction, Hume say. It's not enough that things had properties in the past. We need to know why we are justified in relying on induction. Somebody just telling you that they do in fact reason some way doesn't tell you that their way of reasoning is justifiable. And many times in the recorded history of humanity, we've seen that people have reasoned certain ways and they shouldn't have been reasoning that way. And just because something used to have certain properties doesn't mean that similar things now will have the same properties, unless somebody can give us some reason to think that experience of objects in the past has anything at all to do with objects in the present or future. So here is one way to lay out the problem of induction. We are looking for a missing premise. The first premise we know, such an object has always been attended with such an effect. I'm just using Hume's language here. So we've always seen a certain object to have particular effects. Then the premise that we need is premise two, and the conclusion that we are arriving at is other objects which are in appearance similar will be attended with similar effects. So what could possibly be that second premise that would get us from premise one to our conclusion? Let's put this in much simpler words and reformulate the argument. One, in the past, such and such has happened. Premise two, who knows? Conclusion, therefore, in the present or future, such and such will also happen. What is it that justifies us in getting from claims about the past to claims about the present or future? What justifies us in doing that? So with these sorts of arguments for induction, again, remember, what we're trying to do is fill in this missing premise. And there can be two different sorts of arguments for induction. Remember that terminology a priori and a posteriori that we've already talked about? A priori arguments for induction would insert some a priori justified proposition as premise two. An a priori justified proposition would be a proposition that's justified not by making reference to experience. And, of course, a posteriori arguments for induction would insert some a posteriori justified proposition as premise two. They would insert some proposition that was justified by experience as premise two. Now, the reason for laying out these two different sorts of, uh, of arguments for induction is that Hume says that both sorts of arguments fail. So we're building up very slowly to Hume's main argument against the justifiability of induction. So one more time, what we're looking for is something to go in that second premise. Something that moves us logically from in the past things have happened to the conclusion that in the present or the future similar things will happen. Let's look first at a priori arguments for induction. These are arguments that attempt to insert some a priori justified or non-sensory justified proposition in as the connection between the past was this way and the present or future will be this way. Well, here's what Hume says about that. That there are no demonstrative, by this he just generally means a priori, arguments in the case seems evident, since it implies no contradiction that the course of nature may change, and that an object seemingly like those which we have experienced may be attended with different or contrary effects. May I not clearly and distinctly conceive that a body falling from the clouds and which in all other respects resembles snow, yet has the taste of salt or the feeling of fire, 
Is there any more intelligible proposition than to affirm that all the trees will flourish in December and January and decay in May and June? Now, whatever is intelligible and what can be distinctly conceived implies no contradiction and can never be proved false by any demonstrative argument or abstract reasoning a priori. So notice what Hume is saying here. If a priori arguments for justification worked, then it would be impossible for present or future instances to not resemble the past. But we can conceive of, and in fact we have experienced, present or future instances not being like the past. The fact that something happened in the past does not guarantee that the present or the future should be a certain way. And of course, you might say, yeah, of course not. We're talking about justification here, and we're only trying to talk about what's probable. The problem is that once you put an a priori justified proposition in and form an a priori argument for induction, you end up turning induction into a sort of deduction where the present or future must exactly resemble the past. But since the present or the future needn't exactly resemble the past, in fact, we can imagine things going very differently than the past, this shows that there's a problem for a priori arguments for induction. Let's turn to a 20th century philosopher, Karl Popper, for essentially the same point. Popper was a philosopher of science who saw that induction seemed to be the sort of thing that needed to be justified before we could do science. And here's what he says right at the beginning of his famous book, The Logic of Scientific Discovery. He says, It is usual to call an inference inductive if it passes from singular statements, sometimes also called particular statements, such as accounts of the results of observations or experiments, to universal statements, such as hypotheses or theories. Now it is far from obvious, from a logical point of view, that we are justified in inferring universal statements from singular ones, no matter how numerous, for any conclusion drawn in this way may always turn out to be false. No matter how many instances of white swans we may have observed, this does not justify the conclusion that all swans are white. The question whether inductive inferences are justified or under what conditions is known as the problem of induction. So Popper is stating essentially the same point here, although in slightly different language. If scientists are using induction to move from the results of particular experiments or observations to general claims about what will happen in the future or what all objects of a certain type are like, then they'll be doing something that's logically unjustifiable. Because just because a few things, or even lots of things, have had a certain property, that doesn't make it impossible that something out there doesn't have that property. But if we're trying to use a priori arguments for induction, it would have to be impossible for the present or the future not to resemble the past. Since it's not impossible for the present or the future not to resemble the past, that tells us there's something very wrong with trying to use a priori arguments for induction. This example that Popper gives here of the white swans is actually a historical example. For a long time, scientists believed that all swans were in fact white because they kept seeing swans and the swans were white. Now, if they had concluded from all of their particular experiences of white swans that all swans were white, they would have been doing something unjustified. And we know this because at one point, scientists did observe a swan that wasn't white, that was in fact black. So that showed that no matter how many times you have experienced something having a certain property, it's still possible that you'll experience something similar having a different property. So we know that a priori arguments for induction don't work. They're too strong. Therefore, what about a posteriori? arguments for induction. Now this is where things get very interesting. It seems like if we're trying to justify induction, we would want to rely on something less strong than an a priori argument. We would want to rely on something like an a posteriori argument. 
But look at what Hume says. If we be, therefore, engaged by arguments to put trust in past experience and make it the standard of our future judgment, these arguments must be probable only, or such as regard matter of fact and real existence according to the division above mentioned. We have said that all arguments concerning existence are founded on the relation of cause and effect, that our knowledge of the relation is derived entirely from experience, and that all our experiential conclusions proceed upon the supposition that the future will be conformable to the past. To endeavor, therefore, the proof of this last supposition by probable arguments or arguments regarding existence must be evidently going in a circle and taking that for granted which is the very point in question. What Hume's pointing out here is something very brilliant on his part. In order to justify induction by a posteriori arguments, we would need to be justifying induction by experience. But if we justify induction by experience, we would need to use induction to get from past experience to the justification of induction. And this, as he points out, is arguing in a circle. It's what philosophers call begging the question, or using your conclusion as one of the premises for your argument in favor of that very conclusion. Now, people out in non-philosophical circles use that phrase, begging the question, somewhat differently. They use it to mean bringing up the question. The standard philosophical uh, definition of begging the question is to argue circularly, or to argue that your conclusion is true using, as a premise, your conclusion itself. So, to put this in simpler terms, to try to use a posteriori arguments for induction would be to do this, to argue in this way. Premise 1. In the past, such and such happened. Premise 2. If in the past such and such happened, then in the present or future, such and such will also happen. Therefore, in the present or future, such and such will also happen. Notice that premise 2 is just a statement of induction. So if we're trying to justify induction, we can't use induction as one of our premises. To put this even more simply, to compress this argument down, this looks like this. Premise 1, induction is justified. Therefore, conclusion, induction is justified. Now, if induction is justified, of course induction is justified. But what we're trying to prove here is that induction is justified, and we can't just assume that it is in order to prove that it is. But any a posteriori argument for induction would need to rely on the fact that since induction worked in the past, it will continue to work in the future. But that relies on induction, proving that the future will resemble the past. So here is just a sum up of that from Hume. Should it be said that from a number of uniform experiments, we infer a connection between the sensible qualities and the secret powers, this, I must confess, seems the same difficulty couch, couched in different terms. The question still recurs on what process of argument this inference is founded. Where is the medium, the interposing ideas, which join propositions so very wide of each other? And to sum all that up, if you want to say that induction is justified and you're going to use your experience of induction working in the past to justify induction, you will be using induction. If you're claiming that induction was working fine in the past and therefore it will work fine now, and that's how you're trying to justify induction, you're saying that the future resembles the past, but the future resembling the past is exactly inductive reasoning. So you can't justify inductive reasoning by reasoning inductively. Now you might wonder, 
Does this just lead us to some sort of epistemological skepticism if we can't rely on arguments about the present or future resembling the past? How can we possibly know anything or even be justified in believing anything at all? Skepticism in epistemology is the position that some epistemological goal, generally either justification or knowledge, is unattainable. So if someone claims that they're an epistemological skeptic, what they're saying is they think there's a problem with getting knowledge or justification. What does this tell us uh, about the conclusions of inductive reasoning? If inductive reasoning is unjustifiable because either a priori arguments don't work and that they turn inductive reasoning into some form of deduction, or inductive arguments don't work because they presuppose the very thing they're trying to prove, then while a priori justification and immediately and directly perceived a posteriori justification will be unaffected, it becomes impossible ever to make justifiable inferences or generalizations from a posteriori justification. So if you immediately experience something and aren't making any inferences, fine. If you're using a priori justification, for example, to run deductive arguments, fine. But any time you have experience and you try to extend that experience, either to the present or the future, or to unexperienced instances, or from particular cases to general cases, without justifying induction, your inferences will be unjustifiable. And this calls seriously into question nearly all scientific conclusions as well as everyday reasoning affecting, for example, our ability to move around the world successfully. Almost all scientific reasoning relies on induction. Almost all of our moving around the world requires induction. How do you know that when you turn the steering wheel of your car left, your car will go in that direction? Because of inductive reasoning. How do you know that when you put your foot on the next stair going down the staircase, you won't float up into the air or go straight through the stairs because of inductive reasoning. How do you know that when you pick up the spoon and try to find your mouth with it, you'll be able to do it successfully? Because of inductive reasoning. Now, notice that Hume is not saying that when people rely on induction, things go very badly for them. He's saying that trying to justify induction isn't possible, and hence, if we're doing epistemological work and trying to make sure that the conclusions we come to are justifiable, we can never rely on induction. Now let me present to you just two solutions. I should note that the problem of induction is a massive problem in epistemology and in the philosophy of science especially, and there are many different formulations of the problem of induction and many different proposed solutions or dissolvings of the problem of induction, as well as different new forms of the problem of induction that aren't exactly the same. but use the same sorts of reasoning as Hume used. So what I'm going to be presenting to you here are just two of the very many proposed solutions to the problem of induction. First, Hume's solution. And notice that I've put solution here in scare quotes because it's not really a solution and he, even Hume himself recognized that. This is a proposed, quote, solution from custom or habit says Hume in a part of the inquiry that you didn't read for today. The principle that leads a person to reason inductively is custom or habit, for wherever the repetition of any particular act or operation produces a propensity to renew the same act or operation without being impelled by any reasoning or process of the understanding, we always say that this propensity is the effect of custom. By employing that word, we pretend not to have given the ultimate reason of such a propensity. We only point out a principle of human nature which is universally acknowledged and which is well known by its effects. So, a psychologist who would point to, for example, conditioning, or an evolutionary biologist who would point to evolutionarily adaptive behaviors, and things that are passed on to, um, to progeny, wouldn't be providing a philosophical solution. 
wouldn't be showing how induction is justified. They'd just be showing why we reason inductively. Where did inductive reasoning come from? Well, it's part of our habits. It's part of our custom. It's ingrained in our genes, or it's something we've been conditioned or trained to do. And this is the best that Hume thinks you can do. Hume, remember, is an empiricist. He won't appeal to anything other than experiential justification, and he thinks the best we can ever get at in trying to give an explanation of induction is not justifying induction, but is instead just saying why it comes about causally. What are the psychological, what are the genetic manifestations and causes of inductive reasoning? Now, you might not be all that impressed with this, since it's not a solution at all. So let's look at somebody who is directly influenced by Hume, Immanuel Kant, and see what his solution looked like. Kant, when he read Hume, said that Hume woke him from his dogmatic slumber. Kant was, before he read Hume, so the story goes, merely saying that we were justified in doing things, justified in reasoning certain ways or believing certain things, but had never tried to figure out how we were in fact justified. So Immanuel Kant's magnum opus, The Critique of Pure Reason, attempts to show how knowledge of the world that outstrips experience is possible. So where does the justification or knowledge that we have that comes apparently from non-experiential sources come from? Well, Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, as well as many other of Kant's writings, is notoriously difficult. But the main point that Kant puts forward is that if we can have scientific and mathematical knowledge at all, then the laws that govern the world, for example, the laws of nature or the metaphysical laws, laws of, for example, what grounds cause and effect, must be the exact same laws as those that govern our cognitive apparatus. Um, and by exact same here, we don't mean that they are one and the same, but they're at least relevantly similar. Now, why think this? Well, scientific and mathematical knowledge require justification that outstrips the merely empirical. Sure, we might learn some things scientifically or mathematically from empirical justification through the senses, but much of what science and mathematics do is make claims that outstrip, that go beyond the merely empirical. The only way for this to happen, says Kant, is for it to be the case that the laws that govern our, our cognitive apparatus to be similar to the laws that govern non-cognitive reality. Thus, Kant's solution to the problem of induction is to show that the structure of inductive reasoning is isomorphic to, or similar in structure to, that of the empirical world. And by examining our inductive reasoning, we can gain knowledge about the structure of the world. Now, as I said, Kant's solution is very complicated. There's a metaphysics, an epistemology, um, a semantics that go along with his transcendental idealism. So I've only given you a very, very small bit here, but the thought that Kant comes up with, and just uh, incidentally, I think that Kant is probably generally right here, is that since our brains, our minds, our reasoning apparatuses, and the world are structured in ways that are similar, we can know things about the world by knowing things about the way our reasoning works, when our reasoning works well. So in this lecture, we've taken a look at the problem of induction, and the problem of induction is a paradigmatic problem that Hume brings up in his inquiry concerning human understanding. More broadly, the inquiry applies empirical reasoning or empiricist reasoning to traditional philosophical problems and shows that the best we can ever do when it comes to many of the traditional philosophical problems is not to justify the way that we've reasoned about them, but just to explain how our reasoning came about. Now, most people have found the inquiry to be a challenge rather than a solution.
Um, we saw this in Kant. Kant took what Hume said to be a challenge to justify these things, because if Hume had the final word, then it seems like almost nothing we ever do has any justification at all to it, particularly in terms of the sciences. So it's not as though Hume was just getting rid of silly reasoning that you might think like metaphysically abstruse reasoning. No. Hume was attacking the general principles by which we gain knowledge of the world. And since induction is so fundamental to how we gain knowledge of the world via experience, we've seen that applying merely empirical reasoning to induction can't justify induction. And the problem of induction has thus stayed with us since Hume's time, and it's something that epistemologists and philosophers of science struggle with. Thank you.